Okay. Uh, in the last session, we talked about the process of translation and we are discussing the, the differences between the prokaryotic translation versus the eukaryotic. What I said in prokaryotic translation, um, whatever mRNA you get uh, by transcription and depending upon where is the start codon and where is the stop codon, that entire portion between the start and the stop will be transcribed into a protein. However, in case of eukaryotes, the mRNA that is uh, obtained by transcription that contains alternate alternate segments. One segment if it codes for amino acids, th the next segment does not have any function. Okay. So, it contains that means, it contains what are you can call it junk sequences means that is not required to make the protein. So, basically in eukaryotes now you have this is suppose the A mRNA. So, it has got different segments and some of the segments are functional state segments means I can call they are functional that means, this is what is code for protein, this is what is code for protein this portion codes for a protein, but this is not this I sorry this is not and this is not. So, now this has to be processed, this has to be processed and this junk portion which is not coding for any amino acid that has to be removed and then the pieces have to be again stitched together. Okay. So, basically what happens now you have to stitch the uh, stitch the pieces that are basically suppose this is A, this is portion B, C, D, E, F. So, you have to remove the B, D and F from it and you now join A with C and with F. This is the one which will now uninterruptedly code for the different amino acids in a protein. Now, this mRNA is what is called mature mRNA. That means, from this now you can synthesize the, uh, the machinery can synthesize the protein and this is what is called immature or pre-RNA. You can call immature or pre mRNA and this can be called as fully functional uh, mRNA. Okay. So, now this part is what is called the one the functional part is called exon and this part is what is called intron. So, that means, what is your pre mRNA which contains of intron and exon. Okay. So, now to make the actual RNA which will be trans, uh, translated into proteins, the you have to take the take this introns out and then add all the exons one after another. Okay. So, that is some complication uh, that is present in the eukaryotes. The question is who does this type of splicing, this is nothing but splicing that you are splicing out this B, you are splicing out this D segment, you are splicing out the E segment and, and then joining the remaining that means, the remaining exons. Okay. This is done by what is uh, an enzyme like molecule spliceozyme, spliceo, spliceozyme S oh sorry S P L C O spliceozyme. What is spliceozyme? Which removes the introns and join the exons together. Okay. Interestingly, I also should have told you earlier, but now this is the occasion where I can mention this that remember this translation process 
the reaction that takes place is a trans acylation the OCO 1 amino acid NH 2 attached to a tRNA where another tRNA has this OCO R 2 NH 2. So, this NH 2 attacks here comes here. However, the question is is there any catalyst to do this reaction because if you take two amino acids which is acylated and try to mix it in a test tube uh, the peptide is not formed right away. It may be formed, but it will be very slow. Means what I am saying that if you take a tRNA and separately outside tRNA attached to one amino acid and another tRNA attached to another amino acid, the question is whether they will react to form a peptide or not. And what has been found that they are not, uh, they are not reacting with each other. The rate will be very slow. So, the next that means there must be some catalysis, some catalysis step or some catalyst is there in the ribosome who is assisting the formation of this peptide chain and that what was found ultimately it is that it is the ribosome itself the RNA that is present in the ribosome that catalyzes this reaction. Okay. One portion, one fact is that these two RNAs, tRNAs, uh, are close to each other. You know, for a reaction to happen, proximity is very important. Okay, because if you take two compounds uh, uh, and mix them together, uh, there is rare chance. The chances that they are very close to each other is very small. Uh, it is basically you have to bring them together so that they are close to each other. Who does that? It is the ribosomal, it is the ribosome because it is bringing because of this codon anticodon interaction, it is bringing the both the tRNAs side by side. So, one factor it has taken care of that is bringing the reactive functionalities very close to each other. Okay. The, the second one is that even if you bring them very close together, do you need any catalysis after that? That means, do you know any assistance to do that reaction? Yes, what happens? I said the, it is the RNA which catalyzes the reaction. Remember, RNA has a nucleophilic 2 prime hydroxy group and it has been found that that 2 prime hydroxy group first attacks this acylated tRNA, releases this one and it forms the tetrahedral the via the tetrahedral complex and then the second NH2 comes and attacks and releases the RNA. It is like very similar to your protein chemi enzyme chemistry like remember chemotrypsin how does it hydrolyze a peptide bond that first the nucleophile attacks forms a tetrahedral intermediate and the next is the water comes and attacks. Okay. It is the same mechanism here instead of your if I write the RNA like this and suppose this is your base and this is the phosphate. So, this will be your 1 carbon, 2 carbon, 3 carbon, 2 prime. So, what I am saying that 2 prime OH is attacking this acyl releasing this one and the next step is the NH2 comes and releases the 2 prime OH. So, this is what is called nothing but nucleophilic catalysis. So, now we are seeing that an RNA molecule, uh, RNA molecule also has catalytic activity and that was a very, uh, very that is a, uh, that is basically uh, nullifying or going against the central dogma of biology because in central dogma of biology it is the proteins which are enzymes that carries out all the reactions. But this is the this is an interesting fact where RNA can act as an enzyme. 
So, when RNA acts as an enzyme, they are called ribozymes. So, ribozymes are nothing but RNA acting as an enzyme in the, that is ribose. So, see, see one uh, important reaction of this uh, formation of the peptide bond by trans um, trans acylation that is uh, through the RNA which is play ribosomal RNA acting as a nucleophile. Okay. Now, let us come to the other one the spliceosome again the spliceosome. Again this as I said this splicing is done by the by RNA molecules. The RNA molecules itself does the splicing and then join the exons together. So, that is another example where RNA can act as an enzyme. In fact, these are Nobel Prize winning work. Uh, Thomas Czech, he first showed that uh, in RNA can also act as an enzyme and these are the two examples that I know that we where the RNA can act as enzymes. One is this peptide bond formation, another is this splicing of the uh, pre the immature RNA, mRNA into the matured form. Okay. So, now let us um, try to do a problem. Okay. Suppose, this is the sequence of the mRNA that is given. Okay. mRNA is nothing but the template mRNA provides the template for the protein synthesis okay. and depending on the sequence of the codons in the mRNA accordingly the primary structure of the protein will be uh, will be dictated. Okay. Now, suppose this is the sequence of the mRNA okay. and now if I ask that write the structure of the peptide that is going to be obtained from it by translation. So, what is the sequence of the peptide that is the question. Now, how to solve this? First you try to find out in this sequence where is your AUG. Okay. Also think of this, this is 5 prime to 3 prime. If it is written in the wrong direction then you have to start from the right to the left. Okay. So, this is 5 prime to 3 prime. So, you start where is your start codon? Remember all these translation starts with AUG with a methiodine. Okay. So, that means your first codon or first amino acid should be methionine. What is the second amino acid? That depends upon what codes what AUG codes for that is what will be your second amino acid. So, for that you need the genetic code. Okay. What was that? Uh, AAG. So, let us go to the code let us see that will have a practice of how to read the genetic code. Where is that genetic code? Let me see. So, AAG A A and G. So, AAG is here. So, it will be lysine you can see. So, that means the second one will be a lysine. So, in that way you can proceed. Yes. So, A J we know that that is a lysine. So, what is the third one? A G G. Now, I am not going back the answer is given here. So, that is the start codon. The second one is methionine the th uh, second one is lysine we have already known AGC codes for AGG codes for arginine AGG. So, the third one is arginine CCC codes for proline. So, that will be proline. So, in this way dotted dotted means it is continuing according to the genetic code and then suddenly last you see that there is a UAA. Now, UAA is a stop codon. So, your protein synthesis will go from here to there. Okay. 
Now, you can have uh, you can have I told you that before the first T RNA comes the M RNA has to bind there is a binding site in the ribos small ribosomal unit uh, that is where the RNA binds and then they look for where is the first AUG. Suppose I have a so this is your in this case this is your RNA uh, binding site the binding site present in the ribosomal subunit on which the mRNA binds that is the anchoring. Okay. Now, why it is important suppose I have a sequence of mRNA where this sequence is there U A A G G suppose this is your anchoring sequence. Okay. Now, you see that there is A U G here and then you can see that there is another A U G here it may happen that there may be several AUGs here. So, now the how the system will will know where to start. If this sequence is suppose where we have written here. So, the A mRNA will bind here and then as it anchors here then it sees the first where is the first AUG. So, the protein synthesis starts here, but suppose this sequence is in between this AUG and that AUG. Suppose here is the anchoring sequence, then what will happen? Your protein synthesis will think that this is my starting codon and the start codon if this is the start codon then the protein synthesis will go from here to there until a stop codon it reaches. So, this anchoring sequence is also important because if there are a lot of AUG which is possible and then which AUG to start with that depends on where the A mRNA has anchored. Okay. So, basically where it is uh, bottom line is that where the place where it is anchored from there the first AUG is your start codon. Okay. If the anchoring sequence is, is between two AUGs then the following the first AUG from the right side means from the uh, from the 5 prime to 3 prime end that will be your start codon. Okay. I think that should be clear now. What is the how correct amino acids are selected during protein synthesis? During protein synthesis I told you this is all corrected means it will depend on the anticodon. Okay. The anticodon is the one which uh, on which interestingly whatever anticodon is here the RNA as if the RNA can recognize that. So, that when the OH is attached to this acylated amino acid, the question is how does it really know what is there here is basically when we work if there is any small uh, needle which pricks into our leg immediately I know because you can think that my head is the realizing point. So, immediately I, I know that there is something a needle which has uh, stuck in my sh in my foot okay. and from there you can tell that, but the message comes to the top. So, as if this is very similar to the human body see whatever it is here the sequence that is called the anticodon sequence immediately this. Uh, in this top point knows that what is here and then accordingly it puts the amino acid. Okay. There is actually a, a, a enzyme which does this job this acylation okay. uh, amino acyl uh, tRNA amino acyl synthase synthetase. Hmm. Okay. Now, a quick look at the uh, again uh, the genetic genetic code some some more okay this is everything is there i think everything is covered now exit side peptide side amino acid side and it is shown here schematically i can show it this is the first amino acid methionine and then it is the a site a site accordingly g g g so ccc will come and ccc codes for 
So, that goes for glycine. So, methionine and glycine will combine and then the reaction methionine is transferred to the glycine, this becomes free. So, what will be the next? Next is it goes to the exit side that moves slides down, it moves and ultimately that is released and that comes to the P site. So, the next A site is free. So, according to the sequence here, the next protein will uh, next tRNA will come. Now, some uh, little bit uh, some consequence of this that if this all these processes like if you can stop the replication by a small molecule then what will happen cell division will not occur. If you can st stop transcription also that problem because the this is a vital process replication, transcription, translation. If you can have find a small molecule which can stop any one of these processes and that molecule if it is selective uh, to an invading organism, then what will happen that you can find a uh, that small molecule can act as a drug. I give you a simple example that bacteria is a prokaryote. So, prokaryotes uh, they are uh, they do not need any splicing, their mRNA uh, does not need any modification. Okay. So, mRNA goes and binds to the ribosome. Now, if you have a small molecule which binds to the suppose which binds to the A site or P site or exit site, if some molecule binds there, then what will happen? This shifting will not take place because your sites are already occupied by small molecules and that can give rise to uh, death of these prokaryotic organisms. And there are many antibiotics which work on this principle, uh, but that will be covered under the, but I just mentioned here that point that there are uh, many scope by which uh, drugs can be designed which can stop this transcription translation processes. Okay. A quick to, uh, word about the genetic code because you see that genetic code is uh, having 64 codons. Okay but we have 20 amino acids. So, if we have 20 amino acids that means, many codons here are coding for the same amino acid. If you look here say U C U codes for a serine, U E C C codes for a serine, U C A also codes for a serine, U C G is also code for a serine. That means, this is what is called degeneracy of the codon. So, many of the codons are degenerate. Degenerate actually is a word used many times in uh, describing the orbitals um, in connection with uh, the MO theory okay. that degeneration. Degeneration degenerate means that the codons which are coding for the they are different codons but they are coding for the same amino acid. Like serine, I could see uh, serine has 4 codons here and also 2 here. So, you see degeneracy of serine is very high, 6 codons which codes for serine and, uh, but there are only very few, only 2 amino acids in fact, which has got a single codon and uh, one is AUG and that is very uh, you can uh, extrapolate your thinking that there should be one codon for methionine because that is the start codon. If the start codon is not a fixed one, if methionine had many, many codons that is lot of degeneracy, then the whole machinery will become very complicated that where to start. So, methionine nature has preserved only one codon for methionine and I think there is one more which has got only one uh, codon and that is tryptophan that also has only one codon. Others have more than others are all degenerate, but serine is a very special case which uh, has so many six 
uh, is there. Uh, there may be four like I could see leucine, you see there are leucine also has six. Six codons codes for leucine and this is uh, very important the number of the degeneracy uh, uh, is very important aspect to consider when we try to uh, make copies of DNA uh, utilizing the genetic machinery. Okay. So, basically what we have done now we have finished the replication last time we have finished the uh, transcription and then we have also uh, covered the translation process. There may be several problems that can be given on these three ones very interesting problems. We will do the problem solving at some point uh, once the course once the biochemistry part of it the biology part of it is done then we will have a quick brush of all the whatever concepts we have covered and then we will go to the medicinal chemistry. Okay. I think that is next our next topic will be I can give a brief introduction and uh, next time we will do that. The next topic is basically that how to if I have a I know that if I have a piece of uh, in bacteria or in living organism if you have DNA double stranded DNA that will be copied via the RNA and ultimately transferred to protein. But many times suppose uh, in this room uh, I am sitting here nobody is here but somebody has come earlier in this room and suppose um, I want to know who has come before me in this classroom. How to know that I will search for any body material which is present in this room. One body material which is likely to be present is the a piece of hair falling uh, usually hair uh, uh, one or two hairs usually fall. Uh. So, I can get a piece of hair from the person who has entered last. Okay. So, I take that piece of hair I isolate whatever DNA is there. But how much DNA I will get? I will get a tiny amount of DNA. Okay. Now, I have to analyze the DNA basically what I want to know who has come here. So, I have to analyze the DNA that means, I have to uh, I have to get the DNA sequence and then whoever is in my suspect list I will check the DNA sequence there uh, and then I will match and then from that matching I can tell who has actually come. But the bottleneck to do this is basically uh, there are two aspects one is that is it that always uh, full matching will be there that is number one question that is a very uh, vital question very fundamental question. But before that uh, the, the thing is that my hands are very tight because I have a very tiny amount of DNA which may not allow me to do any um, any further analysis of that DNA. So, we have to make multiple copies of the DNA that I isolate from a single hair hmm. and uh, there are techniques one technique is what is called polymerase chain reaction PCR. PCR is, is a remarkable process it is a tool essential tool in any biology laboratory and it is continuously being used. Basically PCR is a technique by which you can make copies and copies multiple copies uh, of DNA okay. that is one aspect one way. Another way is that whatever DNA you isolate uh, even if it is small you can insert this piece of DNA into a bacterial DNA some bacteria which is uh, not pathogenic some bacteria where if you can insert that foreign piece of DNA into a bacteria successfully then what will happen when the bacteria grows when you have fermentation 
to grow the bacteria, then the bacteria will make some, well, you can get copies of that DNA in the bacteria and then you can, if you have a technique to isolate back cut that piece of DNA from the bacteria and isolate it, you can get multiple copies of the DNA. Okay. So, these are the two different ways by which you can take multi, get multiple copies of DNA, but because of the simplicity, the PCR technique has attracted uh, the most. However, the other aspect where the, a foreign DNA is implanted into a bacterial cell, into bacterial DNA, that is uh, that has got one advantage in that, that you can always grow the bacteria and then get whenever you need that piece of DNA. Okay. So, we will discuss all these uh, amplification of DNA, the techniques in the next session. Thank you.